everybody and welcome to the windblown plains of Calder Park, just 25 minutes northwest of Melbourne, the site of the 2016 Formula SAE Championships for Australasia. A great weekend of racing is ahead of us and a great weekend of competition which started today. As you can see right now there's no cars on the track but over the weekend a huge number of uh, competitors from all over the world will be here joining us. Now we went out a little bit earlier in the day to the design competition and let's face it this is not a pure motorsport event this is all about engineering design and we caught up with a few of the teams to find out about their designs for Formula SAE 2016. Okay, we're here in the design competition and the first car we're having a look at today is from the University of Waikato in New Zealand. And let's, um, Cess, can you come in from the University of Waikato? Cess, uh, first of all, what's your, uh, first of all, you're very, very tall. I've, I've, I've really picked the right person to talk to. Uh, <laughs> you can kneel down or I can, uh, I can grow a bit. Now, um, tell us a bit about the car. What are the features that you'll be uh, showing people here today? Uh, well, we're representing University of Waikato. Uh, our team is abbreviated to Wismo. Yeah. Uh, so we're powered by a GSI 600 motor into a steel space frame chassis. Uh, revisions this year have involved a new carbon undertray to increase our downforce. Uh, also revised side pods to increase our ducted radiator systems. Uh, our suspension design has also been revised this year. We have a pull rod design at the front and that is designed to more match our roll axis. So in simple terms increase the dynamic stability of it. Uh, we have also incorporated this year a lot of Motec data acquisition systems for our driver training so we can really pinpoint uh, where areas of the car that we need to improve on and how the drivers are performing. Okay, you mentioned the under tray here. Let's, let's go around and have a look around, around the back if we could. Um, Tony, you want to come around here and just take a look at, uh, at what the guys have done down here? Now, just explain the philosophy behind this very narrow, uh, very narrow tunnels there. Tell us how, I mean, have you had any wind tunnel testing or how does this work? Okay, well, we've used a various numbers of testing, uh, predominantly with the use of computers, SOLIDWORKS, FEA, or sorry, CFD is the fluid term. Uh, the idea with an under tray is basically that it accelerates the air underneath the car. This creates a low pressure zone and essentially sucks the car to the ground. Uh, the diffuser at the back, uh, the reason that you've got those sort of lam laminar throats is to generate a more laminar flow at the back. The idea of surrounding this is that it reduces the drag of the car, so you can you know, have less force holding you back. So yeah, those, those are the ideas with the under tray. Uh, it was constructed using a sort of big CNC routed mould, uh, basically, and then all this carbon just goes on top. Uh, it's made of a carbon foam in between it, so you get two skins separated by a foam, which gives it a nice stiff structure, and yet it still remains really light, as we know with carbon fibre. Uh, so those are the main sort of features of that. Uh, yeah, we've got a few other aer aero design packages, but um, obviously those are sort of separate sections of the car. So obviously a lot of the cars, uh, particularly you know, Monash, those sort of guys, uh, Canterbury, they've all gone with wings at the moment. Have you looked at going down that route or is it something that you've tried to avoid and for what reason? Uh, yeah, so wings at the back, if you've noticed, they are very large in SAE. That is mainly due to the low speeds that are operated in. Uh, clear, obviously downforce is highly profitable in Formula Racing. However, we decided just to give it a pass. Basically, the drag to lift ratio was very poor with them. Uh, the penalty that you get for a given downforce is a lot of drag, and that does slow you down. So we decided to go against it. Uh, we've got our simple under tray. Uh, that also serves a few other sort of um, purposes with the body shell. Uh, we had a number of members sort of researching into it that sort of gave us a yes or no answer, and yeah, we just said no. Uh, also the complexity with designing something like that, uh, there's a lot of carbon fibre, um, simply we just, we just gave it a pass. It would be out of our budget and the penalty for the drag is really isn't worth it. You mentioned budgets there, I mean we're seeing increasingly around the world a lot of sophistication in Formula SAE, Formula Student as it's known in, in Europe. Uh, is, is there a danger that the budget whole thing is, is, is getting out of control? Uh, it could, could be. Uh, we do stick to simplicity so we don't try to go for the full just blow the budget and and do that we um, have a lot of sponsorship that helps us out uh, so we're of course very thankful for that and the university obviously does support us hugely as well in terms of budget blowout with the complexity and everything everyone seems to sort of take it at a good level uh, there's no 
you know, big budget blowouts and everyone just coming in and ruining the fun. Everyone seems to sort of, you know, stick to the same sort of ideas and it does turn out being a very sort of similar nature competitive competition. So that that is cool. Okay, well, Seth, uh, good luck to you and the guys at Waikato. Willemar has been a part of Formula One now for nearly 30 years with teams like Benetton, BAR Honda, Ferrari, you name it, he's been heavily involved in the world of Formula One. As I said, he's a judge here this weekend. He'll join us on commentary during the weekend as well. But yesterday I had the opportunity to catch up for a quiet chat with Willem Tote. Well, joining me at a very windy Calder Park for this year's Australasian Formula SAE is well-known Formula One aerodynamicist Willem Tote. Um, Willem started right here in Australia and went over to Europe uh, to follow his dream of uh, racing and uh, getting involved in motorsport at the very top level. He's here this weekend as a judge for Formula SAE and uh, Willem, welcome to uh, welcome to Wind Lane and welcome back to Calder Park. Yeah, thank you. It's been a while since I've been here. Yeah, so, I, I grew up in Frankston, so I grew up in the area I've been here racing worked for Kevin Bartlett in the past which was really great fun for a man called Russell Morden uh, learnt a load got myself a job in Europe uh, a bit of work experience I thought and ended up just being lucky get my, got myself a job in Formula One in what used to be Benetton well Tom and group at the time then became Benetton won some won some world championships lots of races got poached by Ferrari I've just had a ball yeah, it's, it's <laughs> I've been a, lucky I've been a, really let's, lucky let's let's Break that, that down a little bit. I mean, where did you study here in, in, in Australia and what exactly did you study? Well, uh, my, my uh, first university I went to was Melbourne University, but I discovered girls and failed and uh, didn't do so well. Then went, went to La Trobe and finished my degree there. They but didn't actually, have girls there at La Trobe, although oh, yeah, they were ugly but I was ones. Settled, I was settled down there. <laughs> ah, that's good. Uh, yeah, you learn. yeah, in the end, you have to study. You can't just wing it. Yeah. So, uh, But actually, my degree is in biochemistry and genetics, so it's oh. not actually in engineering. Mm -hmm. And But I just love cars and wanted to get involved motorbikes and cars and got myself involved and then just while I was in the UK did some additional study at the Open University to get some better maths and just to bring myself up to speed with what I needed to know. So yeah. you mentioned a couple of names there that we know and particularly one uh, Kevin Bartlett what was that in the days of the Formula 5000? It was just after the 5000 the beginning of the Camaro era right. so it was only his only full-time mechanic because all the other all the all the all the other names basically weren't full-time when I was full-time uh, he paid me very little money. He said it wouldn't be a problem. I thought, why won't it be a problem that I'm earning really little money? He said, because you won't have any time to spend it, boy. I didn't. <laughs> Great character. He taught me so much. He really did. I owe him a lot. You also mentioned Russell Norton. Russell, of course, uh, specialising in open wheelers. Yeah. Uh, what did you What did you do with with Russell? So with with Russell, I basically helped him. I was sort of his chief mechanic, if you like, and helped him get the cars set up and prepared. But also, it taught me a lot about suspension kinematics because uh, the car he had was designed for different size of tyres. So we tuned it to suit the tyres run in Australia. The aerodynamic rules for different were different compared to the parts that we could buy for that sort of car so we did some tuning on the width and position of aerodynamic devices and that taught me how powerful aerodynamics can be and just really got me inspired to learn more about aerodynamics. Yeah? So what made the decision to go overseas to, to Europe? Was it a, a desire to, to make it into Formula One? Was that it the, was, the passion? But it was also so I'd split up with my first wife. I used to be married to a lady called Robin Hamilton who raced in Gemini. So oh, we know, yes, I had been a guest on the show many many years ago yeah. and uh, we split up and I thought you know was it her was it motorsport was it both and really it's both but but motorsport got me really uh, got me really inspired and then I was really lucky in my first year in Europe I was working on sports cars I met Sue my wife we've been together now 33 years so we've been together forever and she without her I'd never have made it because she keeps me calm and I'm quite excitable you mentioned sports cars there what time were you working I in was sports working cars? for uh, a driver called Ray Malik who ran in a Lord Down owned Aston Martin Nimrod a really this uh, is the group C days the group C days yeah learned a huge amount one of our cars went flying, which was a disaster. Of, uh, it's the sort of thing you hate. Got me really interested in aerodynamic safety because basically it's aerodynamics that will make a sports car go flying in the air. And so that's something I've been passionate about from those days on. And it's useful to be passionate about that sort of stuff because we love the sport, but we don't want to be hurting people. Mm. Yeah. From doing the sports cars, at what point did you uh, enter the world of Formula One? Was that something you chased, or did you did the phone I, ring? I one chased day? it. No, I chased it actually. Um, 
I had a really good time working for a man called Ray Malik, who was the sports car driver and engineer. And he's uh, really, uh, uh, he was a great driver, but too tall to be, a, to be say, in, in Formula One. But a really good engineer taught me a huge amount. But I wanted to move into an area where they did research, so I applied to all the Formula One teams got a job at what was Tolman Group as actually a model maker. They had an aerodynamics group of one person, they wanted to grow it into two, and they were looking around for somebody to do the job, and uh, so I got my toe in the door at the bottom level and worked my way up from there. It was fun. Well, who was driving, who was your driver back in those days in the Tolman, that was that before or after Senna? Senna? It was, bef was the, the end of Senna's time with the Tolman Group, mm. and then uh, No, I don't remember. <laughs> it's getting back. Uh, going, getting back away. Going back. But for for me, one of the early drivers that I remember, not so early in in Benetton's times, but uh, one who really made an impression after Senna was Michael Schumacher when he joined Benetton. Well, and you joined Benetton as well, didn't you, around that time? And so, so well, I joined the Tolman Group, which became Benetton. Benetton. So in the in the mid '80s, I joined the Tolman Group, and that became Benetton, and stayed there about nine, ten years, something like that. And from then on you went to Ferrari? From there I was poached to go to Ferrari. I was, um, was that during the time when, uh, when Schumacher had moved to Ferrari? Or no, after, before, he, before moved. he moved. So we moved almost actually, it turned out almost at the same time. What was your role at Ferrari? Uh, head of Aero. So what was it like? Uh, Ferrari, famous, famous team, but uh, somebody I once heard Ferrari describe as motorsports equivalent to the Marx Brothers. Um, <laughs> a successful and very famous team but they're passionate in that very uniquely Italian way that Italian people yeah, they, can be they, can, they, they really benefit Luca, Luca de Montegemolo, the, the boss of Ferrari, did a really smart thing and employed Jean Todd. Jean Todd looked around for ways to make the team stable and work their way towards the front and he then decided he needed someone like Ross Braun, so he employed Ross Braun, and Ross came with Rory Byrne, and the, the two of them had been a really good double act at the, the last of the Benetton years, and then worked really well, and uh, I have a lot of respect for both of them. Yeah. Ross was very successful, I obviously moved on later and was known for his, for his own team and was successful yet again. What's the secret to success? Why, why was he, met, how was he able to turn a, a company, a, a factory like Ferrari around, a team like them around? So, what Ross had, I think, that was special, and John Todd as well, they stayed calm under the most extreme provocation. And sometimes the extreme provocation might be the boss, Luca de Montezemolo, getting very excited about something that's happened. And Ross would just stay calm, absorb any impact, either on the telephone or face-to-face, -face, and none of that anger, if you like, that was being expressed, none of that passion. It's passion that causes the anger, but it was causing some anger, and if that goes straight to the guys doing the work, it's a disaster. And Ross would just absorb that. He's a large lad, so that was helped, yeah? He would just absorb all the rubbish coming from above and not pass anything on. He would just listen to his engineers, decide on a direction, and the team would have one direction. If you wanted to play in a, in, in a slightly different direction, he might give you a few experiments to let you see, is this a good idea or not? But, but very quickly, he'd bring you back onto the straight and narrow. So what he did for the team was give it focus and direction, but one direction, not 20 different things being done at once just because each individual engineer happens to think it's a great idea. And that's what made a difference there. And I think at the, at what, at the Honda, which became Braun, actually the success there was divided in a number of different reasons. And I'd say the guys at Honda will feel, the engineers in particular, will feel very upset that they weren't part of that success because part of the success was due to some smart engineering decisions that Ross made himself. Part was that he convinced the rule makers that certain ideas that were coming forward were perfectly acceptable, but those ideas, the, in particular the double diffuser that the Braun had, the idea actually came from Japan. And from what I know, the company was sold to Braun for very little money, and Honda, in order to not have to pay lots of redundancies, paid a lot of money to the team in the first year to allow it to continue, so they didn't. And then the, the management team, including Ross, that took it over, had that commitment that they needed to keep these people employed, and they took on the commitment of any redundancies that might have to happen after an initial wave that was funded by Honda. 
So uh, the, that management team took a huge risk, but they went from, I don't know, eighth or ninth in the championship to winning the championship. It was just a mega rise. But the engineers in Japan all know, well, the double diffuser idea came from here, and we gifted it to them. We even paid money to them, and then we don't have our name on the trophy. It's just not fair. And it really, it wasn't quite fair. But then also, with our bros there, maybe nobody would have convinced the rule makers to allow that idea on the car, and so on. But How important is it, that whole sort of political uh, manoeuvring within the teams and with the FIA and FOM in order to, to get that sort of stuff through? Well, F1, unlike most types of motorsport, allows the letter of the law to be, so long as you comply with the letter, you can do pretty much what you like, but they do have technical directives and teams correspondence that explain to the teams what will be accepted and what won't be accepted. And Ross was very clever at wording those intelligently to get the answer that he wanted. Whether he wanted uh, a no answer, we're going to circumvent this regulation by doing this, you get a no answer, hopefully, if that's what you're hoping for, and we'll do this, it won't do very much, but we, we think it might bring a little bit of performance, and, and then you don't highlight where it might lead, yeah, and then you get the okay. And Ross was always very clever at that. Well, how long were you in Formula One all up? I've been in, in Formula One about 30 years, and I'd say now at my age, is probably I'm never going back there again, but it's been an absolute blast. I still adore the, the formula, and I think uh, next year will be another interesting year with regulation changes, so I'll be fascinated to watch what, what happens. Um, so, yeah, about 30 years, long time. With your knowledge of uh, Formula One racing and the, particularly the aerodynamics, we're going to see some major changes in 2017. We're seeing bigger tyres, we're seeing bigger wings. The cars are going to be faster, or that seems to be the plan. Absolutely, they'll be faster. At the same time, if they're relying more and more on aerodynamics, are we going to get back to that stage about passing, or does DRS just take care of all of that? Well, my fear is that you do get back to that situation where overtaking will be even more difficult than it is today. Today you can get some great races. You really can get some great races, and the DRS plays a part there. And I fear that they may not have added enough power to the DRS to allow for that additional downforce that they would have. That's a fear. I hope I'm wrong, because yeah, it, should be, it should be good racing again. And the cars will be fast, so that'll be such fun to watch. With your you know, designer's hat on, I mean, if the FAA came to you and gave you the rule book and said, here, with clean sheet, you, des you design it, you tell us what you want, what would, what would it look like? Ah, well, there's your problem. Um, any, any designer in Formula One would love that, if you like, you, that utopia of being able to do almost anything. But the problem would be that you'd make the cars go so quickly that you couldn't really take advantage of the, the downforce. So we're, we're already getting back to cars cornering at over 5G. You go too much beyond 5G, then you, if you, you've sustained that for any length of time, with the blood going sideways in the head, you start to get problems with vision in the drivers. So you just can't afford to let them get too, too fast in the, in the quick corners. Plus, the faster they're going in the corners, if something breaks, it's a very high speed accident and the accident then goes on for a very long time. So you do have to be really careful. But I'd say if you gave an empty box to any Formula One expert and allowed them to design whatever they wanted, the cars would be staggeringly fast because most of the rule changes in recent years have been made, have been modified in order to slow the cars down. The problem is every time they try and slow them down, the Doesn't engineer work. seems to yeah seems to outsmart them. And we've had a moving back to Formula SAE, we've had a similar sort of situation here over the year, the last couple of years. We've seen reductions in the amount of aero, and yet the cars teams get like faster. Monash, the cars seem to have the same down or similar sound down yep. force. Um, from the, your point of view, let's talk about the, what you're doing this week. What's your role this weekend at Formula SAE Australasia? Well, I'm just a volunteer, like all the all officials. We're all volunteers and I'm helping out fundamentally in any area that I can, so probably the main, the main busy day for me will be the design judging day, which is Friday, uh, but I'm helping out with scrutineering, I may even do a little bit of commentary if I'm... We're, hoping, we're I'm, hoping you'll do a little I'm, bit of commentary I've never done us. it, I'm, I've no clue if I'll be any good, but I'll, but I'll give it a crack. And why am I here? Honestly, I think this is about the best training ground that I've ever seen for young engineers. Now, Ross Braun, who we've just been discussing, Ross is the patron of the British 
Formula Student, same, mm. Formula SAE competition. And why? Because basically his view is having seen people coming from Formula SAE teams, he believes you take someone from there, it's like having t taken your top graduate from university and giving them two years experience. These kids arrive and it's like them having already spent two, two years in the company learning loads of stuff, so they are much more quickly useful to a team. And that's also what I've seen. And I, I just think it's one of the best training formulas in the world for any type of engineer because it's not just the engineering and it's not really race cars. They're, they're learning, yes, they're, they're applying this to a race car, but they have to form a team decide who's going to lead it, decide who's going to do the different technical roles. They have to work together as a team. At the end of the competition, I'll bet with a lot of them, they're not going to be mates mm. after the end of the competition. But during the competition, they have to work together. So it's a lot like working in a, in a, in a, uh, a high-tech research company. Then they have to find their own money. They have to deliver a product on time. And it's not just arrive at the competition with the car just now ready. They have to give their drivers training time. They have to give every, every part of it has to be given time. Yeah? You've had an opportunity to have a bit of a look around to, today and um, see the car. Has anything sort of stood out? I mean, what do you think of the standard of this year's competition? Now, I'm not going to mention teams because, but because there are some really, there are some standout things that I just, you just sometimes, you just don't expect, yeah? So I've seen some aerodynamic thing, tweaks, that I thought, that's actually quite nice. And then talking about reducing wings, the car's going faster, for me the great thing is, I'll never design a Formula SAE car for the kids, never. But if, if you ask questions, if you ask clever questions, I'll give you straight answers, yeah? So the kids do ask a lot of questions, and they get straight answers all the time, and I think there's still, another 50% of power available at the same drag, and especially if the rules say reduce your wings, they'll find other ways. Just like we have done in Formula One, they'll find other ways. Um, so I think it's just such a, such a fantastic training ground, really. It's just perfect for people coming into any sort of engineering role. It's interesting the role particularly of aerodynamics uh, in Formula SAE. I remember we did our very first SAE, I think it was 2001, um, and the late Carol Smith was a judge oh, over another, here. Another great engineer. A great, and, and, and brutally honest with a lot of the oh, teams, yeah. and, our, and, the, and Team RMIT Racing will remember that moment forever. <laughs> I can, but he said afterwards, and this was in the time when there were none of the local cars had wings, and he said afterwards, he said, this is this is the killer tweak he said eventually he said somebody somewhere is going to work out the fact that at these low speeds aero can make a difference yeah. and they will be the people and it turned out in the end that monash was one of the first people who yeah. who really found out how to make that work and they, they've got another another good car with a lot of downforce here as well but also i've seen cars with really interesting suspension systems that i look at it and think I'd never do that. And then you look at, then you talk to the kids about how they've designed it. You pick up one wheel at a time. And there are some really clever things that they're doing. There are some really, that's, that's exactly what I love about the, 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 uh, this competition. And see, working in Formula One, once you've spent a few years and you've put all your new ideas in, maybe with a new set of regulations, you'll think some in, in a different way. But I'll always take a few young people and put them into the design team looking at a new, and a new project, especially when there are new rules, because it's usually the young kids who don't know it all, they think they do, and actually, it turns out they know stuff you don't because you think, ah, uh, yeah. A, a great strategy as an engineer in Formula One, because people have been doing so much testing for so many years, a great strategy is just to say to everything, that won't work. Yeah? And you'll be right most of the time. But that's not a way to design a fast car. And so you need your young blood coming in. So I, I wouldn't do that anyway. Yeah? But, but you need your young blood coming in who just see a solution to a problem from a different angle. And then also look for people with different, ex different life experiences, bringing them into a team. Someone from yachting, someone from aerospace, someone from, with a motor racing background, and some young kids to just bring in new blood. And then for me, that's a great way to develop new solutions to old problems. After you finish here at Formula SAE, what are your uh, what are your plans now? What's holiday. your holiday? <laughs> and 
back into motor racing in some sort? Well, I'm, or? Doing, I'm doing a little bit of a uh, little bit of consulting work. I have been doing some consulting for a company racing in LMP1, but they've withdrawn from LMP1, so I can't tell you who we, it is. We can't tell you who it is. No, no. Uh, and Hello, so Wolfgang, if you're watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so, uh, that, so that contract, of course, very suddenly ended. And I'm doing a little bit of consulting for a small team in Switzerland. And actually, honestly, I'm adoring doing some university teaching where I've learned over the years, not while I was at university in my case, but over the years I've picked up all the sort of mathematics you need for the aerospace, for, the, uh, for aerodynamic engineering, and also the, just how to develop facilities in particular, uh, wind tunnel facilities, computational fluid dynamic software. The, you learn a great deal, and passing that on is also great fun. Well, it's one of those, I've always said that this is one of the events that we love most of all on yeah. Pit Lane for that very reason. There's so many new ideas, there's so much young energy, and as I've said a thousand times before, this is about the only motorsport event that we go to where the average age is actually under about 50, so it's, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a fabulous thing for oh, us. Yes. And you just see so many enthusiastic kids, they've you know, it's really hard work, really hard work, with the budgets that they've got as well, to get a vehicle ready and here on the ground, r ready to run. And so many achieve it, it's really, it's inspiring. I find it inspiring. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you here, and we look forward to uh, hearing from you over the course of the weekend on some commentary as well. But for now, we want to thanks for joining us in Pit Lane. Okay, well, we're here having a look at the University of Queensland car. And Tony, if you have a look, they're a, a team that have obviously gone with some aero at the back here. They've got the wing at the back. Just have a look at the, just have a look at some of the attention to detail in here. We've got some ducts down here. Just take a look in there, if you will. Tony, we've got so air is going sort of through there in a slot through there. Um, all sorts of tunnels going on and all sorts of trickery. So let's find out uh, what Connor is from the University of Queensland. Connor, can you just uh, come in? Let's talk about this uh, rear wing for a start. Um, very... Uh... Yeah, so we call this guy the air thief and it's actually made to uh, tunnel air underneath this, this main wing element. Um, without that there, this middle element obviously doesn't get enough air to, to act effectively. So that's the, that's the, the goal of that wing there. Um, the UQ car, we've gone for a superior platform for an aerodynamics package uh, with a high power to weight ratio and a high aerodynamics to um, weight ratio. So as you can see, if you come to the front, we've, we've actually got a shorter, our whole front wing is 200 mil shorter than it was last year to bring that front wing back for more drivability in the car. And we've actually have these interesting uh, wings up the side of the car we call chops. Um, and we could, we're only able to do that because we can exploit packaging opportunities that a normal FSA car with a, a front wishbone design doesn't have that opportunity. Um, and if you look at it, we've actually got a mode separated suspension system. So we've got a very stiff pitch, but single wheel bump is very, very soft. So that allows the, the wheels to conform to the road surface very easily um, while still maintaining a stiff pitch to make the most of that aerodynamic um, capability. Is part of the reason for that because you know, this, this particular track is really, really bumpy out there? Yeah, it was pretty bumpy last year and I think it's going to be bumpy again. Um, so that's why we, we go for that stiff pitch, keep that aero nice and low for ground effects but still not scrape under hard braking. And also the car has a very stiff roll for the, for, the same, for the same benefit for that aerodynamic capability. We run a Yamaha R6 engine. Um, it's a high powered engine but also the four cylinder engine is very reliable. It gives us less issues on track and we can have more reliable track time for more testing. Um, overall we also have a, a carbon monocoque chassis. So that's a carbon fibre monocoque with an aluminium honeycomb core. Um, so this was produced in-house was it? Yeah, yeah, all, the, all manufactured by our students. This is all wet layup design. No pre-preg in this guy. Um, we've pretty much done it with minimal moulds. The only mould was for this top surface. Everything else is a flat panel made on a, on a glass table and then laid up into a um, sort of a, a non-triangulated space frame where we can actually use that to jig every panel into, into place, um, glue it and lay it up into the chassis and that gives us a very strong rigid chassis. But interestingly enough in this car we're not really worried about torsional stiffness because all that torsional stiffness is taken through the structural aero beam, the under tray, and, um, and that's connected by an ARB. If you look down this side, up right there, that's taken through that ARB link which takes the, the roll load of the car. 
So how many people are involved in the team and how many people have come down to, uh, to, to beautiful tropical Calder Park? Yeah, so um, something a bit different about UQ, we operate out of uh, one workshop. We see ourselves as one whole team, but we actually make two cars. So you'll see our electric car getting around. Um, we operate our same workshop, but pretty much overall, we've got about 40 students building two cars. And um, for SAE, we separate into two teams, but really we're one team. What about the benefits of Formula SAE, of taking partner? Do you think this is going to uh, equip you guys better for your you know, move into full-time employment? Oh, 100%. Um, it's, a, it's a massive advantage to, to everyone who, who is deeply involved in the competition. And, um, you know, people, some of our members have gone on to Triple Eight Racing and DJR with the V8s and, and so on like that. Um, it's just the, the experience you get in this competition with the, the design and the CAD and, and it's, it's just invaluable. Well, it's a, it's a great, great car, very interesting in terms of the era. It's very interesting, very visually striking, which is we obviously love for the uh, purpose of uh, television. Right now, uh, good luck to you guys for the weekend. Hope it warms up a little for you, yeah, but uh, yeah. hope it warms up a little for all of us. But for now, thanks for joining us in Pit Lane. Yeah, no worries. Bring us Queensland. Well, one of the uh, more popular teams around uh, Melbourne at the moment is the team from RMIT Racing. This is their petrol car, and... Uh, Pat, for 2016, a uh, bit of a departure from your previous previous cars. Uh, yeah, a little bit. So this year, uh, the car is uh, uh, iterative design from 2015. So we had a few different cars in 14, 13, or uh, back through the years. But this year, we've got something a little bit different. We've got a aerodynamics package for this year, which is really exciting for us. A new turbocharger and um, the 500cc Yamaha engine working out very nicely for us. So uh, really exciting this year. We've um, put in a lot of work and uh, hopefully we can make it happen this year. Great looking car, RMIT racing for, for years sort of, you know, eschewed the whole wing idea and now you've really embraced it. Uh, what was the reason for, for going with this? Well, you can really see uh, throughout the competition that all the teams are making that uh, jump. Uh, so we really wanted to try and invest in our aerodynamics package. We actually did a lot of development in the previous year and uh, this year is our uh, first year choose to, to uh, implement it and um, we're happy with the results. We really uh, really want to see how it goes. You also talked about the uh, new engine. Tell us some, some details about that. So the new engine, um, the engines has been the same package since 2012, but we've got a new turbocharger. We did a little bit of uh, development on a um, GT1238 turbocharger we used last year. We've now got a GT06, a little bit of a smaller turbocharger, looking to get a little bit more uh, spool time on the turbo and uh, make a little bit more power as well. So the, hopefully the response is up and the engine's performing nicely this today. I'm very happy with what the engine team's done, so we should be uh, in good spot. Have you had the opportunity to do much testing? Yeah, so we did some testing throughout the year um, on the previous design as well. We did carry over a few things, so um, we are able to do a lot of testing on the 15 car and the 2016 cars um, had a lot of those design implementations from that testing added to it. So yeah, we've, um, we've been lucky that we've been able to do that testing and now we uh, hope it pays off. In terms of what the students get out of their involvement with Formula SAE, what do you think that it brings to, uh, to, to them? Um, the SAE program is fantastic in the sense that we're actually presenting a product and designing and uh, testing and implementing it, whereas your studies don't always get to have that chance. So uh, here at the team we get to not only go through the design and theoretical part of things, but we get to put hands on, make sure our designs are performing, and that, that's really what the uh, industry is looking for. They're looking for people that can design, but they can also test and make sure that their designs are performing at the highest level. So um, SA has enabled myself to do that. I'm actually now employed as an engineer because of my involvement with SAE and uh, I'm very thankful for it. It's been a lot of work but it's a fantastic program. You've also got the electric team as well. Uh, is there a lot of cross-pollination between the two teams? Yeah, so uh, we're actually trying to um, merge the teams completely. Uh, hopefully next year we hope to run RMIT racing as a whole between electric and petrol. Um, this year we've done uh, common chassis between the teams, so the chassis came out of the same mould and um, there's been a lot of collaboration uh, with suspension as well. So hopefully we can further that throughout the year and uh, going into 2017 we're really excited with that collaboration. We've seen with the electric cars, we've got more electric cars here than ever before and internationally they are uh, in many cases dominating the competition. How long do you think it's going to be before they start dominating here as well? 
Um, I believe that uh, this year we'll see a really large jump in the electric competition. There's uh, some very, very prominent teams, uh, Canterbury, and um, I've heard whispers with um, some other teams that they're uh, starting to move towards electric. And um, yeah, we, we're also collaborating with the electric team because of that uh, move towards electric in SAE. So um, I'm really excited by it. And um, yeah, it's definitely going to be a huge force uh, in the competition to come. Definitely. Well, good luck for the uh, weekend, but for now, thanks for joining us in pit lane. Thanks so much. Cheers. Well, one of the international competitors here at Formula SAE this weekend is the team from Taylor University in Malaysia. And, uh, well, we haven't exactly turned on tropical weather uh, for you, but welcome anyway. Tell us about the car that you're uh, running this weekend in Formula SAE. All right, so we are the second year car. Um, so our l main goal for this year is to minimise as much weight as, ca as we can and also uh, fine-tuning some performances. So last year our car weighed 399 kilos, but this year our car weighs around 300 kilos, so there's 100 kilo off. Um, another thing different than this year was that we look into fine-tuning as much as possible in terms of our suspension and steering since we have some um, handling issues last year. In terms of our engine, we maintain the same, but we look into uh, even more into our ergonomic system as well, putting in uh, our drivers into priority. Yep. So uh, we, we see it's a basically a simple design. There's not a lot in terms of aerodynamics. Did you look at aerodynamics or uh, are you con concentrating on basically getting the, the basics right? Yeah. So last year we made sure that our basics was right. So this year we look into a new development in terms of our diffuser and under tray. Um, looks like it will be working. It will be uh, producing 200 Newton downforce. So you've got, uh, what are your facilities like uh, there? Do you have a, any sort of uh, wind tunnel or has this all been done with CFD? Uh, we only use it CFD because we don't have wind tunnel on campus, but um, according to the judges, we will be able to come up with better testing data with even simple instruments. We are looking into that for Nexus car. One of the advantages that you have is uh, Malaysia still actually has a car industry. I mean, so I imagine that there's a, a lot of interest in uh, automotive engineering in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. um, so being an FSAE, um, these students or my team has definitely gained an advantage into uh, being into automotive industry. Um, however, since we are the first uh, team who went into FSA last year, um, this has definitely opened being, it's an eye-opening experience for the team as well as for the country to be in such international competitions. And it's certainly growing. I mean, the motorsport scene over there is growing as well. I went over there myself a couple of years ago to, uh, to, to, to the circuit over there. So um, do you think that there's more jobs going to come, both in the general, general automotive industry, but also for racing teams as well? Hopefully, since there are a lot more local races, not FSA standards, but there are a lot more local races in Malaysia. And now FSA has already introduced in Malaysia as well. So I think that will definitely open a lot more job opportunities in Malaysia in terms of racing as well. So what do you hope for this weekend? I mean, what are you looking for in terms of where you finish? Um, definitely looking into finishing all uh, as compared to last year and coming, uh, coming off a better ranking as compared to last year as well. Okay, Farah, well, best of luck for you and your team this weekend and thanks for joining us in pit lane. Thank you so much. Thanks, mate. Terrific. Do you want to get some shots of the... Uh, yeah, that's around the camp? Do you, if you want to point out any stuff to Tony... OK, we're in the pits here at Formula SAE and the car in front of us right now is uh, come all the way from Poland, Silesia Automotive from uh, Poland. And uh, let's talk about, uh, while I ma managed to mangle uh, your language, you can have a, have a go with ours. Um, tell us about the car and tell us about the uh, journey to get here to Calder. Uh, we got here from Poland just uh, last week. We shipped the car by plane. Uh, uh, it was uh, time consuming and really pushed the team to the limit, but we ma managed to overcome every uh, barrier. So what was the attraction of uh, coming down to Formula SAE Australasia? It's mainly because uh, we had the opportunity to come here and we just wanted to take advantage of seen this great country. So tell us a bit about the car. Um, what's the, what are the design features of the car? What should we be looking at? The, the main design feature is powerful engine. It's Yamaha FZS 600 turbocharged. It makes about 140 uh, horsepower. Uh, the other main feature is Chromoly space uh, space frame and uh, carbon bodywork. Body 
So tell us about the engine. That's uh, an awful lot of uh, power to be coming out of that engine. Uh, something that you've designed yourself. What have you uh, put into in terms of the input for the engine and in particular the supercharging? It's uh, it's c c custom exhaust manifold, custom downpipe. Uh, the whole intake is custom. We developed the package through the years, so that's why we came that far with it. Uh, the engine is modified. There's a lot of modifications that would be hard to list uh, most of them. You've probably had the opportunity to have a good look at the uh, competition. What is your impressions of the standard of the cars here this weekend? We are really impressed by the level of the other cars at the competition. And we think that it's a great experience to come down here and see how it's done down under. Well, best of luck for the weekend. Uh, have, have fun. Once again, we hope it warms up for you. But for now, thanks for joining us in pit lane. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for that. Well, as you can see, judging continues behind me with the RMIT team, both petrol and electric, and we'll see them in action over the weekend. Incidentally, thank you to RMIT University who have made this all possible. Uh, the whole stream over the weekend is made possible and brought to you by RMIT University here in Melbourne. Now, if you want to, uh, if you want to take part in the conversation, we're on the Inpit Lane YouTube channel. There's a chat there. We're hoping to be able to monitor that a bit, uh, a bit better this year. We're, look, trust me, people, we're really, really busy. But uh, we're going to try and monitor Formula SAE and also on Twitter, the hashtag, hashtag FSAE A. FSAE A. That's the hashtag if you would like to uh, ask any questions or join in the conversation from this year's Formula SAE competition. So I hope you'll all be watching. Uh, right over the weekend, we kick off at 9 o'clock local time with the acceleration test and also the skid pan. And then in the afternoon, we're going to move on to the uh, autocross. Then all day Sunday, the Enduro. So a big weekend of uh, a big weekend of action here on the Inpit Lane YouTube channel for Formula SAE 2016. So until we see you, hopefully over the weekend, from all of us here at Inpit Lane. Bye for now.